Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Tech TLDR. I know it's been a little bit, kind of a hectic uh, time going on, but we're going to be back onto a normal schedule starting today. Today, we're going to be talking about the SN11's upcoming cryo test, a lot of news coming from SpaceX, the different things Elon Musk has been tweeting, as well as a little article from NASA themselves regarding the future of materials in space. So, if you want to know everything, be sure to stick the whole episode. Drop a like on the video if you want to stay on the tech side of YouTube, and let's get into this. But first, SpaceX successfully launched and landed another Falcon 9 for more of their Starlings, putting another 60 into orbit just this morning, or depending on what time you're living in, evening, wherever. Either way, earlier SpaceX did successfully launch their Falcon 9 and put 60 more of the Starlings into orbit. The Falcon 9 was able to successfully land back on the drone ship out in the Atlantic. Another successful mission for SpaceX. This is the second one since their previous failure so they've now have two successful in a row so they're back on track to having a good successful rate if they had landed the one where they missed it where they missed the drone they would have actually broken their own personal record for the most successful landings but those seagulls man you got to watch out for those seagulls so the sn11 the sn11 successfully yesterday actually did a pressure test now today it is going to be hopefully going through a cryo test. The roads are closed and from everything I'm seeing on Twitter from locals in the area, there is clearances from the pad. So it's looking like we will see a cryo test today, which is a really quick turnaround time considering the Aston 11 just at the end of last week finally came out. So the, the progress on this right now is insane that they are doing so much quicker than the SN9 and the SN10. And they have road closure all the way up until 8 p.m., which in their local time right now is about 12 p.m. So they have eight more hours to do this. I'm pretty confident they will get the cryo test done. It's a lot simpler than doing the static fire. So I would say that today, or by tomorrow actually, we'll be talking about the successful cryo test of the SN11, which the cryo test again is to make sure that it can handle the propellants and the temperatures once it goes actually up into near outer orbit things like that and if it doesn't do it today we can see here on the Cameron County's website they have the road closure again for tomorrow only from 7 a.m to 12 p.m it's kind of an odd schedule when you compare it to the rest of the days but there is still that slight closure if they do need it but that means that we're not going to see a static fired tomorrow if they do the cryo test today that's just not enough time window for them to do anything like that and since there's no clearances coming up for saturday or sunday we may have to wait until early next week to see a static fire test, but that's still super early. Only think about it. Only one week turnaround from actually getting this thing out of the high bay onto its launch pad and then doing the pressure test, the cryo test, and then hopefully again, hopefully the static fire test by the beginning of next week. That is insanely quick turnaround time. And we know that the SN11 is going to have a big improvement regarding the SN10. The Raptor engine modifications are already on the new SN11. And also talking about updates regarding the SN11. So we can see here, this came from Austin Barnard on Twitter, that the SN11's landing legs are actually being tested, which they did not do with the SN10. So they're testing them, the crew is working them out, making sure that everything, the components are moving correctly, because that was sort of the suspicion as to why the SN10 did that weird bounce when it landed, that the landing legs just weren't properly. But Elon Musk actually tweeted about this and went on to explain a little more. And from his words, not mine, he is saying the SN10 engine was low on thrust due probably to partial helium ingestion from fuel header tank. Impact of 10 meters a second crushed the legs and part of the skirt. And so with that being said, it wasn't necessarily the landing legs on the SN10 were the problem. They just got crushed. When you have a giant starship on top of you, it's pretty hard to keep that afloat when it's crashing down so quick. So what Elon Musk is talking about them doing is that they're going to fix the rate at which it falls back down to the earth 10 meters a second is going to be too much for these landing legs they might decrease it well they will decrease it what meter per second or what speed they haven't confirmed yet again it's still testing so they may see that hey they may do eight meters per second and that may still be too quick they may have to bring it down it's all testing at this point we have to see and with the modifications to the new raptor ends and the simplicity of it there's going to be a lot less things that can go wrong less leaks any sort of thing like that but we got more from elon musk himself so ars technica tweeted their article 
talking about Rocket Lab, how it's directly challenging the SpaceX with its neutron ro launcher rocket. I talked about before how it's sort of like a, it's a smaller Falcon 9. It's going to handle smaller workloads, but nevertheless, it's going to handle bigger packages than the current rocket, the Electron, that it has. Is the Electron is for very small payloads. So this neutron is going to be between the Electron and the Falcon 9. And Elon Musk did tweet back at this saying that the Falcon 9 is almost always at max capacity. And also saying that SpaceX last year launched roughly double the payload mass of the rest of the world. SpaceX, Elon Musk, they're not afraid of this competition due to the fact that they have so many customers as it is. They have so much stuff going into orbit that something like this is not a concern for their business. The Neutron's not even going to be out for quite some time, so SpaceX has plenty of time to continue on with their Falcon 9 endeavors. It's a trusted rocket vehicle vessel to get whatever it is you want in the space in outer space it's much more efficient and ultimately it comes down to the bang for the buck the price at which you pay if you end up paying if spacex ends up getting their cost from the falcon 9 cheaper than the neutron even if the neutron sure it's smaller but if you're going to pay less for the falcon 9 you're going to go to falcon 9 it's as simple as that I think that's really what Elon Musk is getting at is that they already have so much going on for them and the amount that they can put in that making a smaller rocket really isn't competition for them because it, it's just there's so much already going up. If anything, you would want to make something bigger to handle bigger payloads, a.k.a. a starship. That is what they're working on. So I guess found that really interesting and, you know, a lot of people are speculating about what the future would hold with spacex and these other tech startups these other rocket startups coming into the space ultimately they're not afraid at all spacex they are very confident in what they can do and the last story i want to talk about with you guys it comes from nasa themselves so nasa they are talking about how in order for humans to get into space farther into space something we've talked about in this channel many of times is that humans can't do it unless we have ways to gain resources while in outer space resources materials and so NASA is actually doing um, grants to six colleges to help solve this problem. So three colleges, University of Texas in El Paso, Washington University in St. Louis, and Michigan Technological University all got grants to try to find ways to actually extract um, water vapor from the moon. The testing of all these uh, experiments are going to be held on the moon because it's going to be much more efficient to try to do these things on the moon than wait all the way until Mars. So each one of these colleges gets a max grant of up to $2 million. And again, to find a process in which they can extract, each college has their own way, proposal of how they want to do it, but to get water from the moon, water vapor, to again, so humans can, uh, I would assume, drink. <laughs> That's kind of the point of that. And then another three colleges, University of South Carolina, Vanderbilt, and Ohio State, are working on ways to collect solar energy while in outer space, different ways of how to make it more efficient in the darker areas, especially you think there are dark craters in the moon that have very little sunlight, or once you get out into Mars where the sun is much farther away, that's their proposal and their project. Again, they're getting $2 million maximum grants over two years. And this just proves another bigger point that I've been making that we cannot actually get on outer space. It's not that we can't get there, but we can't build by just bringing stuff from Earth, it's not sustainable. It kind of defeats the entire purpose. The entire purpose of going in outer space is to build with what's there and to not have to destroy our own planet. If we get to Mars and have to constantly annihilate our own resources to put, you know, not the, let's be real here, a lot of the stuff that goes to Mars is going to fail in the beginning. We put all of our good resources into stuff that will most likely blow up it's not a good use of our resources. You might as well find long-term, sustainable ways to get the resources we need in outer space while in outer space. It's a pretty revolutionary idea. I think it's a good idea. Either way, guys, that's all I have for you guys in this episode. If you want more of this content, if you enjoy this, drop a comment, drop a like, subscribe to the channel, and make sure to have a good one.